I'm not even making this up here. That's what this thing is called. The notebook computer. And if we take a look at the underside, we see right here, it also says notebook computer. When we were cleaning out our old house, uh, getting ready to move, and I was like packing up a bunch of stuff, I came across this and all my junk. And I'm looking at it like, like what the heck is this thing? There's like nothing that says anything about specs or you know nothing like there's no labels here like windows you know 95 98 whatever it was the screen however is a uh, quite large for being as old as this thing possibly is it's a 15.1 inch screen and if you kind of look at the i mean you're not gonna be able to see it here but looking at the pixels it looks like it's a fairly high resolution lcd and this thing has to be like from sometime in the mid to late 90s because if we look at this right here this is the cd-rom uh, module and it says March of 98 so yeah late late 90s and so yeah everything comes out that's the the CD-ROM drive and then right here we've got the floppy so I don't know maybe these uh, could have been uh, used for other things as well and then right here we do have a hard drive and this is a basically a, like a 4.1 gig hard drive yeah no clue what's on this no clue where this came from it just happened to be in and all my crap, uh, we are missing a bottom lid down here and looks like this was supposed to be for the battery. The battery looks like it was supposed to be attached with screws, but yeah, no clue where that is. Fortunately, while I was cleaning, I also did find this power supply that looks like it goes to it because the plug fits the connector in the back. And we've got quite a bit of stuff in the back too. We see we've got our parallel port. This looks a little bent, so I don't know. Hopefully nothing's cracked in there. Uh, this looks like maybe yes video this possibly composite This looks like it's for like a port replicator. We got a couple of USBs here Serial VGA keyboard and mouse keyboard and mouse. We've got these little feet that pop out of the bottom So if you want to have it, you know kind of tilted you can I thought we'd uh, try to investigate it a little bit today See what's uh, see if it even works. I have no idea if it even works But like I said, thankfully I've got the power supply here so we can actually test that if anything i have a feeling it might be like a, a maybe a pentium 2 or actually it could even just be like a an old school pentium uh, i'm a little worried about trying to power it up and seeing things go up in smoke but i think we're just gonna have to go for broke on this one and just uh do it anyways yolo so there's a power supply plugged in we're gonna go ahead and plug in power to that all right here comes a power cord for this let's see if it shows anything on here on it's got a charge led and a power led but i mean i don't think that the charge one would light up at all <laughs> here it goes i heard a hmm let's unplug it from here does anything happen i know this yeah this plug is plugged in oh stupid i was just hearing things it's not even plugged in. <laughs> okay let's try and plug it in and contact. Oh, we got power LED on. Okay, that's a good sign. Now let's plug it in here. Okay, that's on. Red LED. All right. What's gonna happen? Okay, hitting the power button. Whoa. Okay, LED's on. nothing on the screen just yet actually that's like a standby yeah it's like a little moon there so I don't know what happens if I hit it again not a I mean it is getting power obviously since these LEDs are on but it does not seem Hope it's not that it needs a battery or something for it to actually function. Yeah, nothing's happening. I have no idea why. I mean, it appears to be getting power, but once we hit the power button and this LED comes on, like nothing else happens. I can't like eject the CD drive. I don't hear the hard drive going at all. So maybe there's something wrong with the power supply section or something wrong with that board. I don't know. Well, then I guess we're just gonna have to open it up. There weren't a ton of screws in this thing, so it looks like this bottom cover should come off fairly easily. Uh, unless something else is holding it from the top. I don't know if maybe there's something underneath the keyboard. Actually, maybe there is something underneath the keyboard, because lifting up on here and it's just not really releasing. Okay, let's see if we can figure out how to take this keyboard out. Alright, so, so we've got a couple of catches right there. Okay, yeah, and you just push these and they release the keyboard. 
There's that. Oh yeah, that looks like it's gonna be a socket seven. Don't really see like any corrosion or anything on that board. Holy crap, 64, this stick right here says 64 megabytes, but I don't know if that's 64 megabytes per stick or 64 megabytes total, like a, like a kit. I mean, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but at the time that was, that was quite a bit. And looks like when somebody put this in, they touched the edge connectors here. Uh, I'm not gonna, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that there, but there's like a little bit of discoloration, like, like it's got some thumbprints on it. Naughty. Yeah, that's uh, surprising. If there is 128 megabytes inside of this thing, that was definitely a lot for the time. I'm just gonna leave that out. Maybe we'll have to give that a cleaning and try to get it working or whatever. Mm, we have a screw right there that could be holding us back. And then right there, right there. Well, now that I think about it, even if there was a problem with the RAM, I would think it would still power up because it still needs to provide power to everything else in order to be able to even get started. And this is still not coming apart. Okay, maybe I need to undo these screws. This whole thing, like the entire case is plastic, so there's like a lot of cracking and stuff already. Okay, that seems to be somewhat coming off. Actually, this looks like it's coming off from here now, even though it like, had nothing to do with that. There it goes, this is lifting up, but uh, we gotta undo some more stuff right here in the front. All right, this is lifting up now. Uh-oh, got just some snap off here. <laughs> what was that? Uh, no clue what that was, but it's a piece of plastic, so nothing too bad. Oh, these are the speakers. Okay, these two little connectors are speakers. And this board, that's the interface for the LCD. So there's a screw holding that down. If I just remove that. Oh, hey, there's a 56K modem card in here. Oh, actually, it's both. Network and 56K modem, so it's uh, like a dual card. This should lift up, I think. Yeah, it just has a board to board interconnect right there so it's got two of them actually so yeah that's the underside there's our touchpad so this board doesn't look bad at all i don't really see like any signs of corrosion or anything i guess we might as well finish taking it out there's a screw right here there's another one here that's all i see at the moment so let's go ahead and take these out okay these are yeah these are screwed to the case so this is gonna have to come off as well that plate i guess this is just for providing some rigidity to the thing because it doesn't really do anything like it's just attached to here and then these these points so yeah it's uh that looks like that's all it's doing okay that looks like this is coming out yeah there it is this whole thing right here that's the power supply for the inside of the thing got this big o2 microchip right here this looks like maybe it's interface for the pcmcia ports oh and check this out there's a set of dip switches right here and then we've got a table right here of settings for our clock rate depending on what like which cpu we've got and then we've also got a dedicated graphics chip right there and on the opposite side we have memory for that so i'm kind of this looks like, I don't know, this thing looks like it might have quite a bit of memory built in. Let's take a look at the CPU. We'll remove the heatsink. Okay, all the screws are off of that, and it should come off now. Looks like maybe it just has paste. There it is. Oh, it had a pad. That's an interesting looking CPU. It's still socketed, but the actual processor is mounted to the board. And then it's just got this, uh, like a fiberglass substrate. All the pins are at the bottom. And there is a socket. It's just like a very, very low profile socket. So this uh, would be replaceable. It's got this, like a heat spreader on top. It's like a this gold uh, colored heat spreader. Yeah, that's interesting. And this also says uh, March of 98. And we got, got another table right here. We've got a CPU IO voltage. And then we've got our CPU core voltage settings. Yeah, so that's going to be another dip switch somewhere. Oh, that's uh, these tables right here are for these two dip switches on the power supply. So the power supply looks like it might have just some switching regulators providing power to the to the CPU. We can figure out what CPU we have without even taking it out just by looking at these dip switches here and comparing it to this table. So we have a dip switch uh, one, two are both off. So we would have to go to the table here and see which ones uh, those are. So we have let's see, off, off, uh, one twenty. 
We have off off at 166. Off off at 233, 200, and 233, depending on which CPU it is. Okay, so we've got that partially narrowed down. So the next two are both on. So we've got, see, off off, on, off. Okay, so it's not that. Off off, on, on. So it could be this 166 uh, right here, this uh, this Tillamook one. And off off, off off, 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 Okay, looks like it's going to be this 166. Let's see, PU right here. Four, five is off, so five is off, and six is on, so six is on right there. And yeah, it's gonna be this this 166 megahertz CPU. And uh, we got the next two are off, and okay, seven and eight doesn't care. Nine and ten are both on. Nine and ten are on right here. So, yep. So it's a 166 megahertz CPU. Could this possibly be configured incorrectly? If we look at the label here on the CPU, we see P55C and it says dash 200T. And I'm not sure, it says like P-10? But the thing is set up for a 166. Hmm. All right, well, since this is all sorts of confusing, maybe we'd have some better luck if we actually pull off the CPU and see if there's any information underneath it. So we can actually run this pry tool just kind of all the way around the edges here and it's slowly coming up. I'm trying not to do too much on one end or like on each uh, edge because I don't want to bend it, but it is coming up and it's just going to take a little bit more kind of wiggling here, but it should come up here fairly soon. It is separating. Okay, that edge is like pretty much almost out. This side is pretty much out and that side is out. All right, let's see what's underneath. Aha, we got information oh oh wow the plot thickens <laughs> this is a 266 megahertz cpu so according to the information i've found so far on this it's a pentium mmx it's got a, a 66 megahertz uh, bus speed the table here on the board doesn't even go up to 266 so uh what gives or i guess maybe they were just kind of running it underclocked is all i can think of and it's got a core voltage of 1.85 to 2.15. I.O. voltage of 2.375 to 2.625 from what I could find. So according to these dip switches and our tables here, it is set for 2.5 volts uh, CPU I.O. voltage. So that should be okay. And then the core voltage is set at, at 2 volts on here. So that should be fine. Okay, so maybe this wasn't 200. It's 266. Okay, so that makes sense. I'm not gonna bother like messing with any of the jumpers or the dip switches or anything like that at the moment since uh, I don't know it seems to be configured like you know in a manner that should work but I'm going to go ahead and try to power it up just uh, the board by itself here and see if it does anything uh, check out this uh, heatsink and fan here you can take this shroud off here at the top it almost looks like just a small fan that was that was cut for the to allow the air to you know kind of go off uh, into the fins here and out so i don't know this whole thing just seems kind of a little janky <laughs> almost like if it was a prototype or something okay i've got the heat sink on i'm gonna borrow the little led and power button board off of the top of the the case got the leds on but nothing seems to be happening is anything getting warm? Hey, actually, that would be a good task for the thermal camera. See if anything warms up when we plug this thing in and hit the power button. I have a feeling that this LED right here is supposed to turn green. But, you know, this uh, sort of like sleep light comes on. So, like I said, I have no idea what that's all about. Let's go ahead and try it. So, that's on. What do we see? It's kind of looking at... Okay, yeah, stuff's getting power. Yep, stuff's getting warm. Like, like that chip right there, that down there, looks like it's the chipset. So yeah, definitely stuff is coming alive. Oh, actually, and then now this light turned off, so looks like it went back into like standby. So let's hit the power button again. Yep, there it goes. At this point in time, I think I've come up with like three possible hypotheses as to why this thing will not power up. Number one, 
which would be the hardest one to confirm, is that this thing possibly needs to have a battery installed because maybe it does some sort of communication with the battery pack. I don't think I have ever actually come across a laptop that would not work without the battery. This could be for some reason some completely oddball case where that happens to be <laughs> the, the case. So I'm kind of hoping it's not that. Uh, two, maybe something wrong with the power supply. There's a couple of fuses here, but those are fine. Maybe some bad capacitors. I don't know. That's a possibly. Three, maybe it's got something to do with the CMOS settings or something and this battery. Uh, I measured the battery voltage. It was on like two volts or so. So I don't know, maybe something like corrupted in the settings or whatever, and it's just not allowing the, the thing to, to power up. So I think this one would be the easiest one to check at the moment. So I could just remove the battery and that would just basically wipe anything that's uh, stored in in its uh, volatile memory. Okay, so I've got the battery removed. Let's go ahead and try it again and see what it does. Okay, so the red LED is on again. That happens when we push power. This LED is on again. This one doesn't change. Let's try reconnecting the display and see if we get anything on that now yeah no even with the display reattached nothing's happening still all right well since nothing else seems to be getting us anywhere uh short of uh, checking the capacitors on this power supply let's just actually see what kind of voltages we're possibly maybe getting in some points around the power supply board because we would expect to see the 2.5 that it's set to uh, hopefully somewhere around here that would be for the CPU I.O. voltage. And then we'd also expect to see two volts somewhere around here. And that's for the core voltage because that's what it's set to. So we'd expect to see, uh, what was it, like 19 volts somewhere around here at the input? I think it was like around here somewhere. Okay, there it is. Okay, 20 volts. So that's our input voltage. And now I got to find some way to turn this thing on just to make things easier here to power it up. Uh, I've got this wire that I've soldered here to this, uh, it's going to this brown one right here. This red one's doing nothing, but I just taped everything here together so that it's it's not going to touch anything else. So the second from the right over here, that's the the power on pin that goes to the button. And it, all it needs to do is, it just needs to be grounded. So that way I can power it up from the opposite side because otherwise I have no access to that switch to the button that would be on, on this board. So that will allow me to power it up because it seems to like turn on for for a little bit But then it it shuts back off and yeah, I don't really know why it's doing that So let's go ahead and pow plug this back in. Let's make sure we've got our Thing here in the view. Okay, so now let's check make sure that we've got that night or that 20 oops Should have put this on bolts <laughs> Okay, we got 20 there. I'm guessing that was a ground. I just kind of accidentally shorted it a little bit. Well, I done killed it. <laughs> oh man, I'm extremely disappointed in myself. I, I should not have been poking around with these stupid leads without having some sort of like insulation or something up towards the front uh, basically what I did is when I put the positive over on this side I was trying to touch just the, this terminal here on, on this capacitor but I ended up shorting these two points on on those capacitors right there let me zoom in here a little bit so you can see it better so yeah so basically I, I shorted this one to this one when I was trying to just poke that one and this appears to be a low voltage line that goes to like some of the other components on the board. And the ground point is right there. These two capacitors appear to be connected in parallel, but this is the positive and that's the positive. So that's the ground. But on this one, this one appears to be the ground and that's the positive. So yeah, I accidentally shorted those two together and I actually smelt a little bit of genie. Not exactly sure where exactly it came from, but it seems to have been coming from this area, which leads me to believe that this is the one that that took the hit there. Then that's an FW82439TX and appears to be like basically like the main controller for this thing. 
Uh, however, on a more positive note, I was able to test the two RAM sticks in my Armada 1700, and it turns out that, yeah, yeah both of those sticks are 64 megabytes each. At this point, since we can't power this thing up, the only way we're going to be able to know the resolution of this LCD is to just remove it from its frame. So I've already taken off four screws that were uh, in these corners and then down here. And then that makes this uh, front bezel come off. And that's the actual LCD. A couple interesting things here is that they actually got two CCFL drivers. Yo, focus. Okay. So it's got two lamps, one on the top and bottom. So that means that this display is possibly uh, pretty bright. Especially for its day, a lot of times you would see like one CCFL like, you know, on the bottom or on the top or like somewhere on the side if it was like a smaller LCD or whatever. So yeah, this one's got two. So I was a little surprised by that. On the bottom inverter, we have a little read relay right there. So that piece of plastic that popped out earlier in the video when I was opening it up, which was this right here, is actually a small cover that fits right over that rectangular hole right there. Turns out what was there was this magnet. So that fits inside, just like that. And then this cover just basically had a couple of these molten rivets that kind of just held it in place. When I popped it out, that metal shielding in the back just kind of popped this out. And what happened was the magnet fell out and got attached to the metal shielding. So what that is, is it's our lid switch. So as the lid closes down, that reed switch gets closer to the magnet and it uh, conducts uh, across it. So that's how the laptop would know that the lid was closed. As far as the resolution of the display, it turns out it's really not as high as I thought it was maybe going to be. I was able to figure that out by actually lifting the display out of the casing and looking up that model number right there. That's HLD 1505-020120. And it's just a 1024 by 768 display. I couldn't really find a data sheet, but that's uh, pretty much all the references I could find said 1024 by 768. So it's pretty much the same as that Armada that I got. And another interesting he thing here on this top cover is that it actually has a bunch of different display manufacturers. It says that it's got a Hosoden 15.1 inch, Kyocera 13.8 inch. I don't know what that's all about. Maybe they would actually like fit that in here, but then it had like a smaller like bezel or something. I have no idea. LG 14.1, Hosoden 13.3, LG 13.3, and a Samsung 13.3. But then over here in this little corner, we say we see that we have a Hosoden 15.1. The only other thing that could maybe provide some answers as to what this thing was is the hard drive. So my thoughts were I could stick this into the Armada and try to boot it and see what was on it. And maybe there's something in the software that would give us a clue as to a model number or something about this particular notebook. Before doing that, though, I wanted to clone it. That way, if I screwed something up, you know, at least I'd have a backup or whatever, and I could actually take that backup and write it to another hard drive, and I could, you know, maybe use the other hard drive instead of this one, you know, in case something happened. We see that I've already kind of got a bad track record here, so... <laughs> it turns out there are two partitions on this drive, and while the cloning process initially started off going pretty well, at one point, it once it got to, like, the second partition, which was a larger one, it, it crapped out for some reason. I don't know why or what happened or anything. So yeah, it just didn't complete. And so I don't know if there's something wrong with this drive. It looks like, I mean, it sounded like it was, you know, working okay, but yeah, so I couldn't get that to complete. So unfortunately, I think our only option here is going to be to just stick this into the Armada and see if it boots. It drives in the Armada now. So we're going to power it up and see if it boots, what it does, uh, what's on it. So here we go. Windows 2000 Professional. Why does it give us two options here? Huh, that's interesting. All right, well, let's just go with the first one. See what that does. It's probably going to take a little long right now just because of drivers and stuff that probably has to load for some of the... Hardware that might be slightly different on this laptop than the the one that that hard drive came from. Okay, let's see. Control Alt Delete. Control Alt Delete does nothing. I'm wondering if I'm gonna have to plug in an external keyboard. I'm just gonna plug in a PS2 keyboard over here on the side and see if I can get it to do anything with the keyboard. I'm probably gonna have to restart it though because I doubt this is gonna work.
<laughs> the second time around. The video driver failed to initialize. Okay. I guess we'll restart it and try that second option. I had to mess with this thing for a little bit, but the keyboard is finally responding and so is the touchpad. And it booted on that second instance of Windows 2000. That first one always just keeps crashing. So yeah, um, don't know what, what's going on with that. But anyway, so we're here now and we see that we have an administrator on the username and for password, check it out. I'm gonna hit enter and we're in. So <laughs> whoever installed this like didn't set up a password or anything. It looks like this is just a clean install of Windows 2000. There's absolutely like nothing on here. There is some stuff that's saved on that other partition. I've gone through this and tried to see if there was like anything that would identify the manufacturer or anything, but there is absolutely nothing. No mention of any manufacturer or anything like that, which leads me to believe that you know the laptop that this hard drive came from was uh, built but there was like no oem you know installation of of the os like say on like a dell or a toshiba or you know anything like that where sometimes in the, in the files you will find some evidence of like who made it this look appears to just be like a completely clean like a retail uh, disc or or whatever so yeah unfortunately still have no answers to that however the one thing I can answer is how I came to acqu into acquiring that machine. It's apparently belonged to somebody that worked in a, in the medical field. And that makes sense because around the time when I would have acquired this, I used to do a lot of, of little side jobs here and there. And, you know, sometimes it would be just moving stuff from like an old system to like some new machine that they got. And so a lot of times when they had old stuff laying around that they didn't want anymore, it was broken or whatever, you know, they'd ask me if I just wanted it for, for parts or whatever. They knew that this kind of the stuff that I did. So yeah, that's basically how I ended up acquiring like a lot of the crap that I have now and just stuff that, you know, I just kind of had stored for, for years and all that stuff. And that's, probably where that computer came from as to the who it actually was i have no clue but at least i can kind of say that that's probably you know how that that came to happen there's really not like a whole ton of stuff on here uh, it appears that it may have been used as kind of more of a machine for like presentation which maybe could explain why that other machine was configured with that video encoder you know they probably like plugged this into like tvs or something or, like back in the day or maybe you know projectors or whatever to like you know just display some general information or you know do a presentation or, or stuff like that so that's pretty much the only answers I have as to, you know, what that machine possibly could have been used for. So now that we've had a good chance to look inside of this thing and try to investigate it as best as we could, what's our final spec sheet? Well, it turns out we have a 266 megahertz Pentium MMX with what looks like 512 kilobytes of external cache. We have 128 megabytes of SD RAM. We have a Chips and Technologies B65555 graphics IC with what appears to be 4 megabytes of video RAM. And that's driving a 1024 by 768 LCD. For the video out, we have a Crontel CH7002D, which is a VGA to NTSC slash PAL encoder. For the audio, we have an ESS audio drive ES1879S along with an ES692S synthesizer chip. And from what I could find, that particular chip was actually not too common to see. So it's a little surprising that this one actually has it built onto the board. Apparently, it sounds like it would have been like a fairly decent synthesizer chip for the time. And then for storage, we had our four gigabyte drive. And our optical drive is a TX CD-224E, which is a 24X CD-ROM drive. Our keyboard is a 102 key keyboard that actually has a number pad built onto the side of it. So that's gonna do it for this one. Well, unfortunately we were unable to answer who exactly built this machine. At least we were able to figure out its specs and see what was inside of it. And unfortunately I, <laughs> I did a little more damage than I was hoping to do. Thanks you guys for watching once again and I'll see you guys around the bench.